Thank you for coming to Wisconsin. Appreciate you guys being here. Um, I want to thank Matt, Jonathan, Self Fund uh, Health for putting this together. They're doing a lot uh, for us. Do I have a clicker up here too? Yeah, I think this works. Um, but I appreciate what they're doing, and uh, I think they're doing a lot of good work and appreciate the, the uh, time that they've spent putting this together. Uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Tim Murray. I'm a physician uh, uh, and opened Solstice Health in 2012. Uh, and we did so with the intention of being able to offer uh, affordable, accessible care to the masses uh, and do so in a way that's transparent so everybody can see exactly uh, what we're doing without the shroud of, of health care and insurance. Um, they actually tasked me with the physician's role. I don't know how many physicians are in the room today. Is there that many? Okay, there's a couple. So I'm, I'm sort of speaking to a handful, but I think it's good for everybody else to see uh, exactly what physicians are going through, um, and so sort of our role in the free market uh, healthcare movement. I don't know if the clicker's working. Uh, so I thought this was a great code. It's ama amazing how much panic one honest man can spread among a multitude of hypocrites, um, because that's what we're here for. We're here to be honest, we're here to be transparent, uh, and I just thought that was fitting uh, for this particular conference. Show of hands. How many people in the room know who all three of these people are? Wow. One, okay, one person. Okay, Sean Penn, pretty easy. Kate Del Castillo, she's an actor in Mexico. And then El Chapo Guzman. So he is, he, <laughs> safe to say this is the last place you're gonna see a drug lord in this conference. Uh, but Chapo Guzman is, is, is the infamous drug lord of the Sinaloa cartel. I, I found this picture fitting and interesting from a physician standpoint because these two knew a lot about Chapo. I can't get into the whole story because I don't have time. They only gave me 20 minutes. Uh, and those of you who know me know I can talk for a long time. Um, but these two were unsuspecting of really what was going on behind the scenes, but they knew a lot about him. And I felt like that was pretty fitting for a physician because we know a lot about what's going on in the system, but we don't really know what's going on truly behind the scenes. And I think we need to. Uh, his story is interesting um, because he uh, dropped out of school in the third grade, but somehow by 2009, he made it to the Forbes billionaire list. Uh, so he's a very smart guy. The interesting part, I think, is that these drug cartels and the drug lords, they create this Robin Hood effect. Um, so they're, they're doing a lot of bad things. They're obviously uh, not good people, uh, but they are doing a lot of good things for the community as well. And that's why a lot of these people love them when you go into the communities at large in different countries because they invest money back in. Uh, they create lots of infrastructure, including schools and hospitals. And so they create this, this Robin Hood effect, uh, which I think is an interesting dichotomy. Um, but I, I really want to focus on the word cartel. There's a lot of different definitions for the word cartel. And I think uh, Wikipedia probably had the best uh, complete definition. And it's a group of independent market participants who collude with each other as well as agreeing to not to compete with each other in order to improve their profits and dominate the market. So I want you guys to keep that in mind as we progress through this uh, particular talk, uh, and, and generally speaking, because that's a, it's really important to understand the independent market participants. So these are our local hospitals in Wisconsin. We've got a lot of great ones. Uh, they're all over the place. There's Freighter, top left corner. I train there. It's a great medical campus, level one trauma center. They do amazing work, amazing research. Uh, American Family Children's in Madison, another great academic center. And then one of our local hospitals here in Milwaukee, uh, Columbia St. Mary's. All very uh, great organizations and doing a lot of great work, I think, uh, for the communities at large. But these hospitals can't operate without the BUCAs. If there's anyone here that doesn't know what a BUCA is, it's an acronym for Blue Cross United Cigna Aetna, uh, and they can't really operate functionally without them. Uh, as well, the big pharmaceutical companies, manufacturers, and PBMs, as you can see on the screen, these are the top five across the top, uh, cannot function uh, without either of those two. And then, of course, there's hospital uh, health care administration. And by the way, I'm talking fast. I know I told you I have 20 minutes. If you miss anything, just ask me afterwards. Don't, don't blink. Um, healthcare administration uh, makes up about 30% of the overall healthcare cost in this country, which is over a trillion dollars. So it's a significant expense within uh, the different independent components of healthcare. Obviously, the billing and insurance attorneys, marketing middlemen. And then John talked a little bit about the C-suite. We uh, physicians like to make fun of the C-suite people and pick on them a little bit. 
I think that uh, that's also become sort of common knowledge across the country uh, because of their high salaries. Uh, some of these guys are making, you know, eight, 10, 20 million dollars a year. Uh, and more often than not, because they have an MBA, they know the next thing to do is hire consultants. Uh, and, and then, of course, have meetings about meetings. So, so we, we deal with this in the hospital, and we have to sit through meetings about meetings with them instead of actually uh, doing healthcare, which is what we want to be doing. But the thing that they all have in common is they have zero knowledge about patient care. They know nothing, uh, and we know everything. And these are the people who are, are sort of leading us and dictating what we do as physicians. Uh, and it really absolutely shouldn't be that way, which is why we are sitting here today uh, and we've done the things that we've done uh, across the country to be able to offer direct patient contracts and contract with patients directly and employers directly to be able to offer affordable, transparent care. This clicker is almost working. So back to the cartel. Uh, hospitals, buca, pharma, administration. Together, they create a healthcare cartel. Uh, Keith Smith, I know, is here, is going to speak later. Uh, he mentioned this or coined this phrase at least the first time I heard it when I talked with him about 13 years ago. Uh, and it resonated with me because I'm part of that. Uh, and and I, I used to work within that. And we do a lot of great things. Like I told you, these hospitals are doing a lot of great work, a lot of emergency care, referrals to specialists. Uh, American Hospital Association president uh, put out a, a blog last week, or, or I'm sorry, a month ago. Uh, and he titled it, uh, Hospitals are Symbols of Hope, Comfort, and Care for All People and Always. And that sounds really great, uh, but I don't think that's necessarily always true. But when you work within there, you, you do have that feeling of, of really doing a good job for your patients. You're trying to do the best job you can, but we're oftentimes hamstrung with the way that they force us to provide care. Uh, and I don't think it's always safe for patients, and I think for the people sitting in this room, it's important to understand what goes on behind the scenes, uh, because you guys don't get to see that. We see it all, especially in the operating room. We put patients to sleep, to sleep so you really don't see what's going on, uh, and, and it's really important to know. So we often think that the U.S. has the best healthcare in the world, um, and I don't know that that's true either, uh, because that's been studied as well, but I think for the people working within the organizations or within the system or within the cartel, uh, it creates sort of a Stockholm Syndrome for us, much like the Robin Hood effect. Um, because what's actually going on, and John mentioned this as well, healthcare has grown to be 20% of our gross domestic product. Commonwealth Fund put a study out uh, several years ago showing that we have the worst outcomes among 11 other high-income countries, uh, but yet we have the highest healthcare expenditures per person. So we're, we're sort of number one in the worst spot. Uh, number one cause of bankruptcy, and obviously we're here in Wisconsin, so we can't forget that we are now the fourth highest healthcare cost in the country. Uh, I did get a chuckle when this study came out at the end of last year because shortly after that, the beginning of the year, uh, one of the local health systems uh, that I won't mention, but John did, uh, put out another memo or a press release that their healthcare costs went up. So somehow they missed the memo and or they're trying to be the number one spot, which I think they're trying to do. Uh, and I think when that merger happens, they'll probably be the, the highest healthcare cost in the country. As physicians, we are pressed to do a lot of unnecessary tests and procedures. Uh, everybody talks about defensive medicine. It's true. Uh, we have to do certain things that insurance dictates. We don't necessarily want to get an x-ray before we get an MRI, but they force us to. We don't necessarily want to get PT before uh, we see a surgeon, but they force us to. Um, and so we have to do that from a defensive standpoint. There's a lot of patient demand. Obviously, Dr. Google, if any of you out there love Google, stop doing it. We hate it. Um, and there's corporate practice of medicine. Uh, I had a, an incident uh, many years ago working at a, a work comp facility. The director came in at a one-month survey and said, Dr. Murray, we just wanted to, we like to talk with you guys each time we come in here and wanted to sit down and let you know that your imaging uh, percentage is around 10%. We'd like you to be at around 40 and I said, oh, that's interesting. Can you say that again when I record you this time? And he said, oh, no, no, it's professional opinion. Uh, but, but there is that pressure to do more when you don't really need to. Um, burnout is huge uh, in the hospital setting. Uh, it's, I, I see it a lot in the operating room. There's a huge amount of turnover. Uh, the hospital hiring practices are really bad uh, in that they are offering big bonuses to nurses. So nurses will, are smarter than everyone. They hop from hospital to hospital, they get a $20,000 bonus, stay there for two years and go back to the same hospital and get another $20,000 bonus. Uh, so we have high rates of turnover. And what ends up happening for us when we're, when we're working is we're doing more with less people. 
And the administrators look at that and say, wow, we're still churning out the same amount of revenue, and we have less people working for us now, so let's keep that going. And they create these islands of time where we don't have people working with us to really provide the best patient care possible. And there ends up being no beds in the, in the, in the hospital sometimes. They've closed down floors multiple times in the hospital because there's no staff. I've gone in the, the PACU, uh, the recovery room, at 5 o'clock in the evening and seen a completely full recovery room with no cases on the board and asked the question, why are there so many patients in here? It's because we don't have beds. We don't have staff, so the whole floor is closed. So now we're an overflow unit, and we're doing inpatient care in the recovery room. You guys don't see that, but you need to know that. Uh, and, and that's why we, again, are trying to do what we're doing to help offset some of that. Uh, near and dear to our heart is employment and non-competes. Uh, the cartel in general was very um, savvy, I think, over the last 20 to 30 years. And they've known that these primary care facilities really operate on a 1% margin. And when you continue to add the, hot, the insurance and billing, et cetera, the EMRs, uh, revenue declines significantly. And so you can't do business anymore. So they sold out. Hospitals bought up all the primary care. What ends up happening as a result of that is the specialty care ends up losing all their referral source. So now they have no referral source, and they can no longer uh, continue the same revenue uh, generating that they normally do. They end up then getting employed by the hospital system. Uh, and we end up having a situation where now everybody is employed. Wisconsin is probably one of the worst states for that. Uh, there's very few independent physicians uh, around. Uh, and so it does create a big issue. Non-competes are another issue that I think we have. Uh, both of these things, though, I think there's some silver lining. And just a couple of months ago, the FTC issued a, a ban on non-competes. I don't know if that's going to actually go into effect next month, uh, but we will see. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people fighting that. But the cartels love sick care, and they hate price transparency. A uh, couple of quick non-compete anecdotes. Uh, when I founded Solstice Health in 2012, I was working for an independent anesthesia group um, that had several hospitals. Um, I had a specialty-specific non-compete. It was 20 miles. I opened up Solstice Health 20 miles away from the hospital. Hospital immediately cried foul, called my group, and said, Dr. Murray's competing with us. We need him to stop. Group called me, told me to close my business. I said no, uh, and that relationship ended very quickly, as you can imagine. Um, a couple of years ago, a colleague of mine, orthopedic surgeon, decided to go out and do some uh, independent expert witness. And part of his contract was uh, the, he had to, the hospital had to share in those fees, so they came to him and demanded to have half of the proceeds uh, that he was making as an expert witness. And so he, that was a nail in the coffin for him. He gave a six-month notice. He had an 18-month, uh, 18 30-mile non-compete, so he was driving back and forth to Milwaukee uh, hour and a half each way to be able to cover those 18 months, and now he's working across the street from the same hospital. Uh, so they obviously lost that one. Uh, and then fast forward a decade later, we're still alive and well. We're stu do still doing well and growing. A uh, local large hospital just called me because there's a big void of anesthesiologists across the country. They asked me to come in and help provide some anesthesia services for them. I agreed to it. I scheduled it. Two weeks later, I got a phone call saying, you know what? We're canceling you because you own a company called Solstice Health. And of course, I, I, you know, I argued with him and told him he was crazy, and obviously it's the patient's suffering because now, now you're, you're going to have to find someone else to do that. Um, so it, it's really a, a form of control that, that, uh, that they love to have. Uh, this, this sort of disgusts everyone, I think. At least it does for us, and I think there's a lot of other people talking about this. Uh, doctors cannot own hospitals, uh, and, and, and I think it's a shame. Lawyers can own their law firms, bankers can own banks, so on and so forth. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that? Why is the government, uh, according to the Affordable Care Act, able to stop us from owning hospitals? Um, they stopped physicians entirely from owning hospitals, and the physicians that already owned hospitals, they stopped them from being able to expand, uh, which was part of the law. But all you got to do is look at the top 10 lobbyists. Four, five, six, seven, they hold the top spots, Pharma, American Hospital Association, Blue Cross Blue Shield, AMA. Uh, and they do, uh, I think it's $100 million a year just in lobbying back and forth with the government. So they're looking for control. And the only thing, that the best place you can control is the revenue generators. I am the revenue generator. The other people that raised their hand here early are the revenue generators. No one else generates revenue but us. Uh, and so when they do that, they're also to conceal the prices. And price transparency is another topic. That's sort of the biggest topic here, I think, at least for me, is being able to be transparent for the employers, transparent to the brokers, transparent to everybody else, uh, because it's, it's, it's baseline important no matter what you do. When you go to the store, you want to know how much you pay for milk. When you get your oil change, you want to know how much you pay. This is the only industry that you can give a plastic card and get services done and have absolutely no clue what you're paying. Uh, and it's a shame. So price transparency law went into effect January of 2021, uh, last administration. And I think it was a step in the right direction, but they didn't do enough. 
There was really only two metrics that they had to do to be able to um, comply with the law, so to speak. And it was to be able to have a user-friendly format and to be able to have a machine-readable file. Those are the only two things. Uh, and if you didn't comply, the max penalty you could have was $2 million. That sounds like a lot, and I'll get to that in a second. So I went online, and I did this for you. I blacked everything out so you couldn't see what organization I was looking up in Wisconsin. Very user-friendly. I was able to type in the website. I was able to click on some nice hyperlinks of the individual organizations that were on there. And when you clicked on those hyperlinks, it brought you to the next page, which was totally blank. But it has a really cool button that says download. Very user-friendly. All you got to do is click. Super, they, they complied perfectly there. The problem was, every time I clicked the button, my, my computer crashed three times. Literally crashed three times. And I kept trying to figure out why. And then I looked at the bottom of this Word document, and it's, it's a 39,000-page document, machine-readable file. Uh, and so that is obviously complying, but it's not complying with the user-friendliness. I did sit there and page through for a while, uh, much to my wife's chagrin. And, and I, found, uh, I found several hernias, all the same hernias, different organizations, different insurance. And uh, I, it was anywhere between, I think, $19,000 and $40,000 for a simple hernia repair. So obviously, total trash. Um, the the uh, penalty is $330 a day for hospitals less than 30. And it's, it's like, anybody, is there any diabetics out here on insulin that are on a sliding scale? This is just like a sliding scale for a diabetic. Uh, and you end up uh, increasing that by $10 a day for every bet over that, but the max penalty is, is uh, $2 million. The issue for that, for me, is that sounds like a big number, but the top 50 hospitals' net patient revenue is, is greater than $3.6 billion. So that's less than a fraction of a percent, which is basically cost of doing business. So a $2 million penalty is nothing for these guys. Uh, they just laugh at it, and they don't post it. Uh, fast forward to July 2024, there was a hearing just a month ago. I think Chris Deacon was there. Is she here today, Matt? I don't know if she's here. Uh, but she's a champion for price transparency. She was there advocating for us, health price, uh, Healthcare Price Transparency Act 2.0. So this is now getting really sexy because we have 2.0, and we're just waiting to see what they do in 2025. I don't think anything's going to happen. But while they sit there and try and figure that all out, we've already solved it for them. Uh, Keith Smith will talk later. Pay close attention to him. He's been doing this for a very, very long time. Uh, uh, Solstice Health, Wellbridge Surgical followed suit within the last five years, but Keith's been doing it for over 20 years. This is user-friendly. There's no machine-readable file. And all you got to do is click on it, a body part, and you can figure out what your cost is. Surgeon, anesthesiologist, facility fee, and you're done. That's the cost. If all of us went to these places right now, we'd pay the same price. If we all went into a local hospital system, we would all pay a different price. And that's a shame, because it's the same operation. Obviously, there's, there, there's, there's different uh, uh, technicalities with surgeries, but this is, this is all the same price across the board. So we did this for employers. We did this for individuals, uh, so that we could be transparent with the prices, and they can then start to budget what they're doing on a, on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, and then obviously annually. We also did this in the primary care space. Uh, and we started about uh, almost 13 years ago now, and, and many have followed suit since then. And this is just a handful of people across the state of Wisconsin that are doing direct primary care. Direct primary care is a monthly membership fee for those who don't know who, what that is. You pay, on average, $59 a month in our setting, and you get unlimited visits, no co-pays, and everything else is wholesale labs, imaging pharmaceuticals, et cetera. And so we've solved some of the highest cost drivers, surgery, labs, imaging, these are some of the highest cost drivers. I think we're, I think we're charging $300 for an MRI, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, hospitals uh, charging about $3,000. So we've solved a couple of large components uh, in the healthcare system for that. Um, this is Herb. Herb is, uh, is the consultant that I alluded to earlier that the uh, uh, hospital CEOs love to bring in and, and create a lot of stupid chaos in a hospital. Uh, but they come in with these ideas with no experience in healthcare, uh, and these are, again, two anecdotes that I can tell you about. I'm sure there's many, many more. But these guys literally come in. For some reason, I feel like all the consultants, the healthcare people in the room, don't all the consultants seem to come from Colorado? It's like every time there's a consultant from Colorado, we end up getting something new. Uh, I walked into the OR one day, and, and the lights were out. In the OR, there was people scurrying around, the lights were out, and, and I said, what, you know, what are you doing? Is, is the electric out? And they said, no. Haven't you heard the new policy? And I said, no, what's the new policy? And they said, we're doing a, a low-light C-section. And I was like, oh, that sounds really stupid. What, what is that exactly? And it's, well, because it's, when the baby is born, it's a dark environment. They feel so much better. It's good for the baby. It's good for the mom. And I said, that's still stupid. Turn the lights on. 
And we're going to do it because there's so much. I mean, do you want your, your mechanic working in the dark or the person working on your plane working in the dark? we got to do surgical anesthesia. We have equipments and medications we're looking at. This is, this is the definition of insanity. Um, so obviously, that created many meetings about meetings uh, that I had to deal with myself. Um, VBAX is, a, is a, a sort of a more serious concern. Uh, they can be dangerous. Uh, we actually went from, a, from an expert standpoint with the anesthesia group and the OBGYNs, and we said, listen, we're in the middle of a cornfield. We should not be doing vaginal birth after cesarean section. There's a risk of uterine and rupture. Moms can bleed to death very quickly. Babies can bleed to death very quickly, and we don't have a local blood bank. It can be four hours to get blood. Uh, so this is, it's, it's just not a reasonable thing to do, especially when you're only doing four per year. There's not that much revenue associated with that. Um, and they said, you know what, we're going to do it. It doesn't matter what you think or feel. If you don't like it, quit. Uh, and, and, and we're always concerned about these sentinel events that they talk about. That's what a hospital administrator calls something that really bad that happens. We call it death. And, and that's very bad for marketing. Uh, and so they like to market. They actually put this stuff in the newspaper. Gentle C-sections, low light C-sections. They market this stuff and it just blows our mind. Uh, but again, this was a unilateral decision by the administration and so obviously I quit. Uh, and and it, it takes a little bit of courage to, to do that, I, I will say. Who's the biggest loser? Everyone's the biggest loser. Hospitals lose, physicians lose, but ultimately it's the patient, right? I mean, we have unaffordable care, inaccessible care, and oftentimes unsafe care in a setting where we have people telling a physician, an expert, what to do and how to do that, when they can do it, how often they need to be doing it. Uh, and so we have tried our best, and I think the physicians in the room here are also trying their best to be able to directly communicate, directly contract with patients individually or corporately in bigger organizations, because we know that it's important for us to be able to sit with them, be honest with them, tell them the truth, and help them be a part of their healthcare, uh, not just uh, tell them what to do. So what's our role? Uh, and again, this does not really apply to a lot of the people here, but at least you know what I think our role is, is we need to know our value. We've all had 20 plus years of schooling. We have the highest level of expertise in healthcare. Uh, again, which is why we should be the ones making those decisions for our patients, not the, not the people around us. But you have to understand your value. Uh, during the time of COVID, another you know, herb came out and said, let's market healthcare heroes. That sounds awesome. Uh, you're not a healthcare hero if you're a physician here. You're just a doctor, okay? That's our job. It's what we do. We're heroes every day, not just during pandemics. Um, and, and I think the most important thing that I tell people uh, in the operating room when we're working in a group of people is understand the level of power that you have. We are the ones that create the money here. We're the ones that create all the billing here. And we're the ones taking care of patients. Nobody outside of the operating room does anything to create money other than however, you know, whatever your metrics are, uh, metrics are for marketing. Um, but, but you have to understand that power and you have to be able to leverage that power to your advantage for your patients. So educate yourself, avoid complacency, I think that physicians are very complacent in general. I think John alluded to this as well, uh, because we don't know what things cost. I mean, I sat and studied this for about four years before I founded Solstice Health, just to really get a handle on what was going on. It was easy to see in the operating room, because you could see a knee brace one month being $200, and then the hospital loses $3 million in rural subsidies, and then all of a sudden, you know, the next month it's, uh, you know, several thousand dollars. And, and so you start to see these things and wonder to yourself, why is this happening? How is this possible? So you really need to educate yourself because your patients deserve to know. You need to care for, protect your patients. Uh, quick fact, primum non nocere, first do no harm, is actually not in the Hippocratic Oath, uh, even though we talk about it all the time. But it basically says the same thing. It says abstain from whatever is deleterious, and that includes financial harm. Uh, so if you don't know what you're charging your patients, and you can't have a conversation with them so that they can be a part of their care, uh, I think you're creating financial harm to your patient, and so you really need to know what's going on. Uh, your knowledge and your skill are your weapons, so use them to protect your patients. I hate your clicker, Matt. <laughs> you got to have courage to circumvent uh, the cartel or circumvent the system, so to speak. Notice that all of us, none of us have said we want to crush the system. None of us want to stop the system from functioning. We want it to function. We want to function with them. We need to have a collegial relationship. They need to know what we're good at. We need to know what they're good at. Uh, and, and be able to uh, uh, work together on that. So uh, if you can, just do it. Do what Nike says to do and just do it. Uh, have the courage to jump off the boat and, uh, and go for it. It's not for the faint of heart. It's very difficult. It's very lonely. It's a long road, uh, but it's worth it in the end. If you can't do it, just join it. Uh, if you hate business and you're a physician and you want to join one of our groups, there's a whole lot of groups on that screen there 
uh, that I think that you could join and you could still be a part of this movement in, in, a, in a much larger way than just sitting back and watching it. Uh, Marty McCurry is going to be speaking at some point. He's probably the epitome of just be passionate about it. Uh, he's written a book called The Price We Pay. You should all read it if you haven't. Uh, I'm sure he'll talk a little bit about it, but he's, he works for a system. He works for Johns Hopkins. That's, that's, a, that's a pillar uh, in the country, uh, and I believe he still has a job there. But he wrote a book, and, and, and it was an indictment for the most part on the, on the hospital system. It was an indictment on the game that he likes to call it. Uh, and and, and it's, it's just, again, being passionate about it, being honest enough to tell, uh, be able to tell the truth about it. And if you can't do that, just stop complaining if you're a physician. Uh, your patients feel it. Uh, everybody hears it. Uh, it's, it's just not conducive to patient care, so you just need to stop. And if it's so easy, just do it, right? Get, get back out there and do it. Uh, I think this movement's obviously going to continue to uh, create a paradigm shift for everyone. It's going to help the hospital systems. It's ultimately going to help the physicians who are working in the system so that they can provide better care uh, to their patients as well. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because I'll probably get myself in trouble. Um, but I, I, my dad sent me this the other day. Uh, it says, nowadays, people will take their kids to the ER for a scraped knee. When I was a kid, I died. And my dad said, uh, walk it off. Uh, and, and so this is, this is sort of the common sense approach. We need to be able to talk to people uh, and tell them and, and really help them understand you don't need to go there. You don't need to go to urgent care for a headache. We need to be helping these people understand how to be better advocates for themselves within the healthcare system. But the, I think the most important thing is, is, is uh, the effects of obesity. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm calling this out there because I think it's important because it is common sense. Uh, and, and I think that we need to be able to be honest with our patients and stop trying to be smart and just talk with them. Uh, but it causes about 95% of our, it's the catalyst for 95% of our health care healthcare issues. And if you're not discussing this when people walk in the door with you, if they're coming in for high blood pressure and you're putting them on another pill and they weigh 400 pounds, you should be talking to them first and foremost about the obesity problem and all of the issues that are created with that. If you tackle this, you, you will tackle the vast majority of our health care expense. So it's really, really, really important, I think, as physicians that we really are honest and we have a common sense approach with our patients and just talk at their level. So I'll leave you, I don't know where my time is at, I'm probably over, but I'll leave you the quote from Billy Graham, when wealth is lost, nothing is lost, when health is lost, something is lost, and when character is lost, all is lost. So that's my charge today to everyone in the room, is don't lose your character when it comes to healthcare, don't lose your dignity as a physician or in the healthcare space, uh, because we have a lot of work to do, uh, and we need you guys' help, so let's get to work. Thank you.